Okay, we're live. <laughs> we're live with a fantastic group of uh, panelists from some of the biggest <laughs> strikes of the second half of uh, 2018. Um, and we'll, we'll get started in a, a couple minutes. Um, I'm just also going to go live on Facebook. Looks like you got an RA. Nope. No, no. It's an imposter. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> uh, just give us one more minute as we work uh, out some of the, uh, as I try to find our one remaining panelist. Oh, there we go. All right, Cruz. Okay, we all of our panelists are uh, are here. You see me? Okay, good. Yes, all of our panelists are not only here, but uh, their audio and video are working. So. Uh, <laughs> Now we can get going. Thank you all for uh, for bearing with us. Um, <clears throat> yes. So I am. <clears throat> this is Dan DiMaggio. I am the assistant editor uh, of Labor Notes. Um, and thank thank you to everyone who's joining us tonight uh, for our end of the year webinar. Uh, this is our our, the third webinar we've done and my first. Uh, <clears throat> so thanks for uh, bearing, bearing with me as I, as I get my bearings here. Um, so tonight we're gonna hear from uh, panelists from four uh, big strikes of the second half of 2018. Um, we have a, a Jenny Johnson who is a uh, hotel worker from Hawaii uh, where they just finished uh, uh, 51 day strike, I believe. Um, she can correct me if I got that wrong. Um, uh, we have Hillary Napsiger, uh, who is a Chicago charter teacher, um, where they just, uh, you know, also uh, had a, where they had the first uh, charter network strike in US history and won. Uh, we have Matt Zills, who is a <laughs> men, uh, mental health care worker at uh, Kaiser uh, in Oakland. Uh, they also just went on a on a week long strike last week, I believe. Um, and we have Mari Cruz Manzanares, um, who is a senior custodian at UC Berkeley, um, where they went on a three day strike uh, against outsourcing um, and and around other issues in October. Um, so I want to thank them all for joining us. Uh, <clears throat> and before we get started, um, 
This uh, webinar is hosted by Labor Notes. If you want to find out more inf information about us, uh, you can visit our website, labornotes.org, um, or our Facebook page, uh, Labor Notes. Um, we are a media and organizing project. Uh, we will celebrate our 40th anniversary uh, next year. <coughs> um, we we'll also uh, take pride in building a network um, of rank and file activists and unions across the country um, <coughs> and in building what we uh, like to call the troublemaking wing of the labor movement. So we're very glad to have these four panelists uh, from that wing of the labor movement uh, joining us. Um, so I'm just going to choose one of you to, uh, to start um, and I will unmute you um, and then we can roll. Um, so Jenny, maybe we could start with you. Um, <clears throat> okay. All right. <laughs> Great. Um, so this is Jenny Johnson uh, from the Sheraton Waikiki. Um, and so Jenny, do you want to tell our audience a little bit about yourself, about where you work, what you do on your job, and what the issues were that led you and your coworkers to this this huge uh, national strike. Sure, absolutely. Um, I'm a cook at the Sheridan Waikiki. Um, I've been there for about seven years. Um, our issue, um, much like what Hillary had mentioned earlier, we um, our contract expired July, June 30th of this year, and um, the company actually wouldn't participate in any negotiations with us at all until after our contract had expired. Um, and then when our contract did expire, um, we had about uh, three months worth of negotiations with them, um, wherein they wouldn't address our our proposals very seriously. Um, um, they opened one of the negotiations simply by saying we reject, you know, all 12 of your proposals that specifically dealt with housekeeping. Um, so they they enter negotiations not being very flexible and not being very open towards some of our requests. Um, mostly what we were looking for in our contract was um, an increase in contributions to our health and medical funds and our pension fund, along with uh, raises. Um, the cost of living here in Hawaii goes up by about 15 to 20 percent a year. Um, and definitely our wages don't. So <laughs> we're all trying to struggle to survive. Um, and we also were specifically looking for some workload reduction issues, um, most specifically in the housekeeping department, um, where the housekeepers were saddled with a 15 room minimum a day, um, which in a seven and a half hour shift gives them about 24 minutes to per room. Um, and they were working through their lunch breaks and not taking their lunch breaks. And we just felt like that was a, a very unacceptable situation. Um, and um, so that was kind of our, our biggest issues, obviously financial um, workload reduction, and then also uh, subcontracting. We have, a, have had a big problem with that here over the last, over the course of the last two contracts here actually, um, all the hotels tend to make an agreement with the union about moving forward and then during the course of the contract slowly um, sneak work away from the the union workers and try and outsource it to external companies. Um, so that was kind of a big issue for us as well. Um, so I guess kind of a little background on what we did. Um, out, we were able to um, actually achieve most to get most of our our proposals the the really important ones that we had asked for um, we did win most of them ultimately after having to be on strike for 51 days um, which was crazy but fun <laughs> and team building um, I found it to be an amazing experience in terms of I, you know, it's this really um, emotionally draining thing to not be at work and to not know how you're going to pay your bills but the emotional bonding that happens with your coworkers when everybody's in the same struggle. Um, that was an oddly rewarding type of group 
building experience that I don't think anybody really saw coming. Um, and that has become a really positive outcome um, for us here in Hawaii. Great. So how did you, yeah, how did you all sustain yourselves for 51 days and, you know, and, and were you following the, the strikes elsewhere in the country? Um, yeah, definitely. Um, part of our situation was that um, the Unite Here locals across the country had worked um, pretty hard over the course of the last two contracts to line everybody's contracts up so that they would all expire this year, mostly so that it gives us collectively more power, obviously, instead of one city going on strike, seven cities across the country went on strike against Marriott at the same time or pretty much about the same time. Um, bringing much greater national attention than you would get in any one location, um, as well as just putting more pressure on uh, Marriott as a company nationally and internationally. Um, uh, let's see. Um, so that was great. Also, um, it again, it sure helps encourage uh, the workers here to know that they're not just, it's not just the workers here, that it is seven other cities that are standing up together, walking out together, um, standing by each other. Um, and, and basically everybody's standing up for the same thing, which is, you know, better wages and, and less corporate greed and, and better um, conditions in, in their work environment, um, which I think most workers all across America in any field probably want. <laughs> um, so that was, it was pretty dynamic, I think, that we got a chance to do this seven cities wide. Um, and we, I do know that towards the end, we had Seattle, uh, the local in Seattle, their contract had expired as well. And kind of after all of the other cities had already voted to go on strike, uh, one of the things that Marriott did is they reached out and worked very hard to settle a contract with Seattle after they had taken their strike vote to ensure that they there wouldn't be an eight city added on. So kind of that action alone, I think demonstrates the power that is created when you have multiple cities walking out together against one company. Mm -hmm. um, so that was pretty tremendous. Yeah. So we're speaking with, uh, with Jenny Johnson, who is a cook at the Sheraton Waikiki um, and recently on strike for 51 days there. Did I get that number right? Yes, you did. <laughs> so, what was the result? What what you know what what came out of your strike? Well, uh, we were able to get um, uh, more than a six dollar uh, wage and benefits increase over the over the course of the contract. Um, so that's not just wages; it's wages and increased contributions to our uh, health and welfare fund as well as our pension fund. Um, that was huge. We were able to also win the room drop for our housekeeping department, which was um, really important for us. Um, that although that won't take effect immediately, that will come, uh, I believe, the beginning of the third year of the contract. Um, we were also able to uh, win some language that protects us against uh, subcontracting moving forward, uh, meaning if the, uh, if the hotel tries to subcontract work out, they, um, that we could actually do, that some department can actually do in the hotel. Um, they will have to pay significant penalties to the union, to the workforce. Um, and then also kind of hand in hand with that, we were actually able to uh, re, I don't know, um, re-secure jobs that we'd actually lost over the course of the last, you know, say um, six or eight years. Um, there were several positions, so a lot of work that had already been contracted out to outside companies, um, and we were able to win those jobs back. So um, uh, th that work will be going back to union union and workers. Um, and all of this is really great because uh, it it turns into job creation. You know, when you get jobs back that have been outsourced, that's new more workers that need to be hired. Um, the room drop in housekeeping, same thing. That's going to need. That's going to demand that the hotel hire 20 to 30 more housekeepers um, and have them on staff every day. So that's that's great. Um, we want to continue to build the union and build um, the member numbers here instead of 
slowly losing them, which is kind of what has been happening. Um, so that was all excellent. And I think probably more importantly, what the, the primary thing we won was some language that secures us against technology and automation in the workforce. So one of the uh, biggest issues with hotels, um, many hotels are introducing mobile apps. So an app that you can download on your phone, and then essentially you can make your reservation on your phone. When you get to the hotel, you can check in via your telephone. There's uh, some sort of key uh, keypad um, device that will be downloaded onto your phone, and then you can check into your room. You can actually enter your room without ever actually speaking to a front desk agent. Um, this is something that we do see happening in other hotels, mostly in the mainland, but at the same time, that is something that dramatically threatens the front desk departments in, in hotel properties. Um, you know, uh, it is happening in a property that's not part of our union, but um, in on another island here, and they, they have said that they get up to 30% a day in mobile check-ins. Um, so we really saw that as being a dramatic threat to the actual numbers of people that would be working in the front desk department. Um, so we did, were able to secure some language that prevents them from just, prevents the company from just bringing in a, a new um, a program or a new form of technology or a new automated program and just introducing it into um, the work environment without giving us a little bit of, uh, we, we won, I think, a six-month notification and more importantly, um, a request that if jobs are lost due to new technology and automation, that those positions, uh, first and foremost, if possible, be retrained to actually participate in the automated systems, the running of the systems, or uh, more importantly, maybe um, discussions between the workforce and the hotel management so that we can see how we can bring automated systems into the hotel to aid workers and to help our jobs along instead of eliminating our positions. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of a, that, that's a really big deal. That was something that was actually won, that language was won by all of the, all of the Unite Here locals that went on strike um, across the country. Outstanding. Um, so thank you to, uh, again, that was Jenny Johnson uh, from Unite Here Local 5 in Hawaii. Um, yep. And uh, congratulations to you. If, if, uh, you, know, if you. you weren't on a, on a webinar, we would give you a standing ovation now, but um, <laughs> pretend. Um, so I, I want to move on to, uh, to our next panelist. Um, uh, Mari Cruz, are you uh, ready to talk now? Yes. Um, great. Can you hear me? So, yes, we can hear you. Um, so I thought it'd be good to go to Mari Cruz Manzanares, who is a senior custodian at UC Berkeley and a member of AFSCME Local 3299. Um, and a number of things that uh, Jenny spoke about was their fight against uh, the outsourcing of, of jobs um, in the hotels. And I know that's been a big issue. Um, for you all uh, in the UC system, uh, which is one of the largest employers in in state of California, right? Yes. <laughs> so I was wondering if you could just, uh, if Mari Cruz, you could just tell us a little bit about where you work, uh, you know, what you do there, and what the what the members of your union do uh, at the University of California. Yes, um, so I've been working at the University of California as a senior custodian for almost 20 years now. I work at the dorms mainly, and Ask Me Local 3299 is one of the largest unions that represents workers, uh, service workers and patient care workers at the university. We, um, we have 24,000 members. Uh, we also have, um, it goes from the 10 campuses and the five medical centers. We have food service workers, custodians, maintenance workers, uh, gardeners, uh, truck drivers. We have uh, security officers and we also, um, among other uh, units and service, but we also have uh, radiology technicians. Uh, we have x-ray technicians. We have uh, respiratory therapists and a variety of other carriers that uh, our union represents in the hospitals. So we would like, uh, we also love to call us ourselves that uh, 
as we run UC because without us, UC can't run, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, our work is very essential for the function of these universities. Right. And can you tell us a little bit about the issues that led to, to your strike uh, in October? Um, you know, and, and what has been going on at the university? What has the university been doing to threaten good jobs there? Yes, uh, the main issues are uh, some by the inequality and the racial disparity that occurs in the um, university system. Um, it, it's like um, a research, uh, we, we have a research that, uh, research that found that the university employment uh, practices are worsening the conditions and the income racial inequality between uh, the workers at the university. Because we do have the executives who make a six figure salaries and we have the bottom lines where people are living with uh, around $37,000 a year. So um, the disparity on the salaries is huge. And the university is always trying to uh, reduce uh, our ability to actually be able to come up with our uh, covering our expenses with the salaries that they are offering. And right now we do have our um, contract fight. Uh, we've been without a contract for two years. So um, almost two years now and two strikes of three days each. So um, the university has been uh, reducing the staffing level. So we also are facing a lot of uh, contracting out our jobs. So job security is threatening our jobs also as our prior panelists said about that. Uh, we do have uh, like our demands in the, on the table about racial justice and uh, uh, salary disparities and all the inequality that is happening at UC, the university has rejected everything that we've been proposing. So uh, the main issues, like I said, is job security, racial mm -hmm. inequality and uh, disparity on salaries. Mm -hmm. And you've, the, the union, AFSCME 3299, has really been explicit that your, your fight is a fight for racial justice, as you, as you said. Can you, uh, expl can you talk a bit more about, about that, um, about what you're trying to win in your contract to, uh, to address racism and racial inequality? Yes, like, for example, over the last 10 years, the ratio between the average salary of UC top 1% uh, of wages are as, um, and the medium salary for all uh, workers from seven to one to nine to one, the, uh, the top administrator salaries grew by 64%. Mm -hmm. And in the other side, on our, on our side, the salaries re was reduced to, uh, from 24 to just 22%. So we didn't get any um, increases uh, compared to other people on the, on the top salary. So, and the overall, um, economic inequality contributed to racial and gender disparity because women, people of color are more likely to be concentrated in a lower paid workers. So um, our, our group of workers are mainly women and people of color, as I said before, and this uh, disparity by the university not uh, tr trying, not even trying to kind of boost us up and keeping us in the, in the bottom areas are very uh, unjust. And so the, 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 the work that we do is essential work, but the university seems like we are not important and treat us like we're not important. So we, we, are, we are calling them out and we are trying to, to make them understand that without us, they're not gonna be able to function, right? So, uh, we do, we do, we are not asking for something that is impossible for them. We are asking for, for what is just for us as a workers and um, as, a, as the ones who maintain this university as one of the best universities in the country. Mm -hmm. So um, I hope I can answer, I did answer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and how did, how did the strike go? You know, briefly, did you get a lot of, did you get support from students, community groups? Uh, you know, what was, what was that like? Yeah, well, actually our strike, uh, the first strike was joined by CNA and APTI, and it was around 50,000 50, people out there. Uh, the community was all, all supportive. 
uh, students body uh, student body was supportive uh, we do have a lot of students who work with us very closely to help us to organize among workers i mean among students and we do have a lot of uh, community members who are like churches that came to our picket lines and told us that uh, what we're doing is right for the community because at the same time is that uh, we improving the lives of the workers and as a union we are also at the same time improving the life of the community that we live in because uh, community and workforce is the same thing right like members in the union are the members who go to church in the same community are the members who go to school are the members and if we don't have the means to actually help this community we all go down so that's the importance of uh, being together with the community. When um, students and, and workers in the community get together is something very powerful. And it was shown in this strike. The second strike was joined by Apti, uh, who is uh, also joined us on the first one. CNA actually set up, set up their contract, but we still fighting for our contract. And that's when, when we're talking about racial disparity is because the university and APTI, I mean, uh, CNA is mainly, um, is other people who are uh, mainly white. There's not a lot of people of color. So the university knows exactly what they're doing, right? They're creating this separation between the two races, like people of color and white, so we can sit, go against each other. In this case, we're not taking it as, as is their fault, is university's fault, is their employer's fault, because they do this on purpose to separate us. But even with that, we are committed to fight. We are committed to continue the uh, the the protections uh, to the worker, the workforce, and the community that we live in. So the university cannot get away with creating more separation between us as workers. We know that we can count on uh, CNA as we did last strike. We know that in sympathy and solidarity is there, but the university is doing everything they can to separate us, and we're not going to allow them to do that. So they say that right now it's like we continue without a contract. We continue uh, fighting for the same thing. Uh, we continue. We're going to continue pushing the university to do the right thing for the well-being of our communities and the works, the workers at the university. Thank you, Ari Cruz. Um, Thanks for sharing the, uh, the, the story uh, from Ask Me 3299 uh, in the University of California system. Um, and Mari Cruz mentioned that the California Nurses uh, Association and UPTI, the professional and technical employees um, uh, at the, at, uh, on UC campuses, uh, you know, honored their picket lines and went on sympathy strikes. Um, my understanding is that 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 a similar dynamic may have played out um, in the Kaiser uh, mental health uh, strike last week. Um, so I'm going to turn to Matt Zills uh, now, and he can talk a bit, uh, tell us a bit about that. Um, so Matt, could you just uh, tell us some more about, uh, you know, who you are, where you work, what you do, um, with what union you're with? Okay. Um, so my name is Matt Zills. I'm a child psychologist at Oakland Medical Center with Kaiser Permanente. Um, I've worked for Kaiser my entire career since graduate school um, as a psychologist, both working with adults and with children and families mostly. Um, I'm part of the National Union of Healthcare Workers. And what our union actually came from a, a smaller side, a smaller division of SEIU years ago in like 2008, um, when we broke off and formed our own union because we felt that SEIU wasn't adequately addressing the needs of healthcare professionals um, and was sort of in league with Kaiser and making agreements and not listening to our members in terms of what we wanted in our contract and what we felt were fair working conditions. Um, so we left and formed our own uh, Union and initially Kaiser was very upset at us for not staying in SEIU and was very aligned with SEIU. So we, similar to Marty Cruz, um, we were without a contract for five years um, and bargaining through that whole process um, until in 2015 they agreed to um, to sign our initial new contract separate with NUHW. And since then NUHW has really grown. The, the the three units that were out um, on strike last week 
were um, the way Kaiser is divided into Northern California and Southern California, there's two separate bargaining units within NUHW that are that represent the same group of workers. They're called in Northern California, they're called uh, integrated behavioral health. And in Southern California, they're called uh, psych social, but it's all the same group of psychologists, uh, licensed clinical social workers, licensed marriage, family and therapists, licensed psychiatric nurses, um, and a couple other types of mental health professionals, um, KDACs who, who work in substance abuse, that kind of thing. Um, and so the three units that were, at, there's also a, a separate unit. NUHW rep basically represents anyone who isn't, uh, any, anyone who's a healthcare professional um, who isn't a nurse or a physician within Kaiser. So it's, um, you know, it's radio, it's, um, radiology technicians, it's optometrists, it's dietitians, it's most people who have a specialized professional degree in some medical field. Um, because the way Kaiser is structured is all the physicians are kind of like the partners in a law firm. And then their administrative wing like governs all of the contracts with the professionals. So we were out on strike um, last week for a five day strike. It's the first strike we've had to do in these, uh, this bargaining process. Um, we've been in pre-bargaining starting in June and then official bargaining starting in July, I believe, um, because our contract expired in September. Um, and we were looking, our main issue was that with the, the, the settling of this contract in 2015, the employer, Kaiser Permanente, instituted a structured um, approach to managing our productivity and our time during our day that they called schedule management. And it was basically intended to, they had agreed to increase their staffing levels after they were fined by the uh, state of California for having unreasonably long wait times. Um, they were fined about $4 million at the time, despite having, you know, making anywhere from three to $4 billion in profit every year and having between 20 and $30 billion in cash reserves. They were really resistant to hiring more staff. So they created um, the structure for our daily time at work in our clinics um, that requires us to see one new patient for every four return patients that we see. And unlike doctors, we can't say we're full or that we're our cat, we, we can't close our panel of new patients. So we continuously get new patients um, and while still having to treat the patients that we are currently seeing. Um, and this is a way that we might be a little different than other bargaining units. We're also beholden to our licensing ethics um, that are governed by our state licensing boards that require us to maintain a certain level of contact and responsivity to patients and provide care that's adequate for the diagnosis that they have. So we were kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place with our employer saying you can only see a patient for an office visit individually every you know, four to eight weeks and our licensing board saying you are responsible for the safety and health of this patient. Um, and so with schedule management, they, they were trying to make sure we we're using every minute of every day possible to see patients face to face, but didn't give us any time to account for phone calls or responding to emails or writing letters, or for those of us who work with children and families, doing a lot of the collateral contact that you have to do with schools and multiple family members um, and that kind of thing. Um, and really what it was an effort was to use the same amount of people to see more patients they did this also at a time where they greatly expanded their patient load due to the Affordable Care Act. So although they, they hired about, they increased their, their workload of therapists by about 30%, they increased their membership by over 100%. Um, so it actually, de it, all of the new people they were hiring, it didn't create any more ability for us to provide care quickly. I mean, I think say probably the most similar thing people would be familiar with is, um, teachers in a teacher's union are, you know, fighting for smaller class sizes so that they can actually teach the, the kids that they're working with. Um, so we felt really strongly about this. And when we went into bargaining, that was one of the things we did in pre-bargaining was to try to address this really onerous thing that they called schedule management that was not actually achieving their goals of helping us provide more consistent and reliable and frequent mental health care. Um, and initially, I was actually on the pre-bargaining committee and I'm on the bargaining committee for our current contract negotiations. 
And Kaiser is very good at putting forth all the appropriate um, lingo and HR, I mean, PR um, statements to make it seem like they're really interest, interested in being collaborative. Um, unfortunately, what they tend to do is they, they don't have any people in their upper administration who can make decisions, who are familiar with the mental health field or have any training in the mental health field. Um, it's mostly doctors, people with MBAs or MPHs, or um, quite a few RNs who have um, advanced into higher levels of administration, but they don't have any therapists um, on their end to understand anything that we're asking them for. So despite having about six sessions of pre-bargaining, we were not able to come into bargaining with a clear idea of how we would restructure this system. Um, and then during bargaining, they basically, during traditional bargaining, they basically we're unwilling to talk about any economic changes, which include any of the benefits changes that we're asking for, um, and wanted to focus mostly on things that don't affect their bottom line at all, and then talking about how we might restructure this schedule management. And we settled on something called provider profiles. So like, what does your day look like every day? How many patients would you see? When are they scheduled? What's the ratio of old patients you would see in a week to new patients you would get in a week and how could you be flexible with that if you had a patient who was very, very acutely suicidal or in danger of needing an um, urgent intervention. And that whole process kind of just stalled because even after they settled an agreement with their um, other alliance of unions that offered, you know, generally Kaiser does offer very strong benefits packages to people, you know, consistent cost of living adjustments over the three years that exceed inflation, um, a very generous um, healthcare package and retirement package. And for whatever reason, in 2015, they were kind of, they sort of targeted our bargaining unit and our division of health, mental health care workers as not wanting to give them all the same benefits they give to all their other unions. Um, they refused to provide, you know, cost of living adjustments that met with inflation. They've said this time they're not willing to re reinstate any of the benefits we had previously. They took away a pension from our Southern California unit um, and it said they won't give it back. Um, and we find this to being singled out as the one union they won't give these things to when they will give it to 100,000 other workers we find to be egregious and not bargaining in good faith. Um, that's not the main reason we went on strike. The main purpose of our strike was to address the drastic understaffing of mental health care. Um, and I think that's why CNA actually joined us is because nurses are familiar with this dynamic within the healthcare system of not prioritizing the types of supportive and preventive care um, and really just trying to focus on, you know, staffing for physicians. And I think the nurses, when they heard what our concerns were, were very, they, they also see a lot of our patients in the emergency room and the medical units because people who don't take care of their mental health often don't take care of their physical health or come to the emergency room with a problem. Um, so yeah, it's mostly about staffing and also just being about offered the same benefits packages that they offer all of their other employees and not being singled out for retribution. Does that answer your question? Totally. So you were, you were on strike for five days last week, but you're, uh, you're, we're back this week. Well, continues. I don't, I don't work, um, on Monday. So I wasn't in the office today. And then tomorrow is our next, our first official bargaining date with the bargaining committee after the strike. So we'll see, we're hoping like fingers crossed, maybe there'll be some movement, but, um, unfortunately what we know from Kaiser is it's a huge bureaucratic organization and they don't send decision makers into the bargaining room. They send like kind of, we sometimes call them punching bags to come and sit and listen to our concerns. And then they have to take them back to their overlords and like get permission to come back and offer us something, which is such a broken way of bargaining because <laughs> it, it, it's not only that the people in the room can't make any agreement, the people in the room might have, like, I think there's two or three people with a mental health degree in the bargaining committee, but they don't have any decision-making power. And then they have to take our proposals back to a room of other people, none of whom work in mental health or have any training in mental health to make decisions without us explaining why we asked for them. So, so, so like with the, yeah. 
So like with the, uh, with Mari Cruz and her uh, coworkers at the University of California, you know, keep your eyes on uh, the ongoing struggle by uh, Kaiser mental health workers for, for a new contract and for, uh, you know, that, that, that ensures timely access, access for, for patients to, uh, to mental health care. Services, yeah, I, right? I just want to say one more thing before I'll, I'll say my piece. Sure. Is, um, we felt this was what a really good opportunity to, with all the public attention to mental health and depression and suicide, to really draw attention to how we can improve this in our country. You hear a lot of rhetoric from politicians about, you know, if we just had better mental health screening, mass shootings wouldn't happen and stuff like that. And those are great statements to make, but what they don't realize is they need to support the, the staffing and the infrastructure providing better mental health care. So actually Patrick Kennedy was a big part of our strike movement and our picketing. He came out and gave several speeches and hosted a forum in Oakland. Um, we're really trying to get more public attention into this area of health that has traditionally been something people are ashamed to talk about and don't um, speak up and demand access to the way they would cancer treatment or diabetes treatment or you know pulmonary hypertension treatment that all of those things are okay, but because mental health can have so much stigma, it's a little bit shameful. We kind of feel like Kaiser is using the fact that people in the public don't like to talk about their mental health struggles to take advantage of those patients and that population to not fund them the way they deserve to be. Thank you for sharing all that, uh, Matt. Uh, heavy duty. Thank you. Um, so again, that was, that was Matt Zills from NUHW, uh, the National H Union of Healthcare Workers. Uh, uh, at Kaiser in Oakland, who just went on strike last week. Um, and we, before we turn to our, uh, our last panelist, uh, and thank you for your patience, Hillary, um, I just want to uh, remind people that if you, have, if you would like to ask a question, um, I believe you can click on the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen uh, and uh, you know, type in a question, and we'll see if we have uh, a few minutes at the end uh, to address um, you know, a couple of questions. Uh, or you may also put it in the chat box. Um, <clears throat> and again, this is the Labor Notes end of the year webinar, um, wrap, wrapping up the year with uh, some really uh, powerful strikes that have happened over the last couple of months. Um, and so uh, now we'll turn to Hillary Nafziger, who uh, is a seventh grade teacher. Um, at a Chicago charter school uh, that's in the Acero network. Um, and she was on strike uh, earlier this month, I believe, um, <laughs> along with uh, you know, hundreds of charter school teachers and support and paraprofessionals and support staff um, uh, in Chicago. And she'll tell us more about that. Um, <laughs> so thanks for being with us again, uh, Hillary and um, uh, and thank you, thank you for your patience in going last year. Um, uh, so, could you could you just tell us a bit about you know where you work and what you do there and what were the what it's like uh, and what were the issues you know yeah. that that sort of led led you all to uh, to go on strike? Yeah, of course. Um, I'm a seventh grade teacher at Carlos Fuentes Charter School. Um, the Acero network within Chicago has 15 schools involved in it. We're not the only charter network that is currently, well, we're not bargaining anymore, but um, bargaining for new contracts this year. Um, but the really exciting part about bargaining this time around versus last time around in 2016 is that we're now a part of the Chicago Teachers Union Local One. So um, having CTU back us for the first time um, in feeling camaraderie with a lot of CPS teachers felt very new this time around um, to bargaining. So the big push that we were really focused on, and I feel like there is a consensus across the board, um, is that we're looking for you know equal work for equal pay. Um, and that <clears throat> our school calendar um, is longer than CPS, our school days are longer than CPS, and we get paid um, lower salaries than CPS teachers. And realizing that a lot of our 
people, um, teachers, paraprofessionals, um, office coordinators, they were leaving us constantly and consistently throughout the years to go to CPS schools and to go to, you know, suburban district schools. And it's just not fair to our kids. You know, like at the end of the day, um, there's zero consistency between teachers for these students and they come back year after year missing so many different teachers that they thought were coming back to them and weren't. Um, so we were really focusing on salaries, not quite for teachers as much as our paraprofessionals, our office staff, our IT, um, you know, all of these people that are so valued in our school where we can't run without them, but we're systematically not paying them what they deserve. Uh, and of course, we have a board um, and a network that runs the charter school, and we have a CEO who just runs, the, like a CEO who runs schools. Like that doesn't make sense to anyone who's an educator, and he makes just as much money as Janice Jackson, the superintendent of CPS, who has like 10 times the amount of workload that he does. Um, so the big push for our strike was calling out Rich Rodriguez, our CEO, who wasn't at the table bargaining with us for eight months, who never showed up to school to talk to parents about any of this, who just sort of said, well, it's a shame that teachers left the bargaining table and that, you know, they don't want to go back to school for the kids, when in all reality, everything we're doing is for our students. Mm -hmm. um, so this was the first, as I understand it, it was the first uh, charter school strike in yeah. history. Um, yeah. So how did you all, you know, get organized to, to do that? Were you, were you afraid? Were you, you know, like what, uh, what gave you the courage to, to go forward? Yeah, there was a lot of fear, a lot of stress, um, mostly on my part. <laughs> um, no, I think it helped. Um, back in 2016, we were very close to striking um, to the point where I was like a strike captain at my campus and I was up every hour and a half or so checking my phone just to see like any updates. Are we official? You know, do we have a contract yet? Are we on strike? What's going on? And I think that this time around, because we had already gone through that two years ago and we were facing the same problems with class sizes that are too large, um, compensation that is not enough, a long calendar and a long work day that just leaves our teachers and all of our school staff burned out. At, at this point in 2018, it was kind of like, get it together, Sarah, like what's going on? Like, how do we still have these issues? How have we not worked something out yet? So our members, I feel like we're more ready this time around because these were issues that we had been fighting for two years previous, and they are, are still issues today. Um, and it helped that we had our contract action teams go out and different schools all across campuses, across the network, um, just checking in with staff regularly every week or two, like, how are you feeling? This is a lot. What are you most concerned about? What are you hoping to get out of this contract? Um, we had teachers take surveys and our paraprofessionals and our OC, um, they all took surveys to say like, this is what we want you to stand up for and this is what we're willing to strike for. So we always knew what our bottom lines were from the very beginning when we started our pre-bargaining in January and then when we started going to the table in April. And then this school year, our contract was um, expiring in October we really made the effort to reach our members and then start checking in with them about the strike months before striking was even going to happen even before we took an authorization vote um, to really reinforce to our members this is so important that we are willing to walk out of our building and we need to make sure you're ready so by the time the strike actually occurred a lot of the stress and a lot of the fear um, it was still there, but it had been pushed aside for a lot of passion and enthusiasm and just willingness to be out there and get our voices heard because this had been a conversation we had been having for literally months. And at that point, it was like, all right, enough talk. They're not going to listen to us unless we make them listen to us. So we're out. We're gone. December 4th, we were ready. And 
I had so many members, I was at the bargaining table. So I didn't really see the action as much as I would have liked to, but I had so many videos and pictures and members just texting me constantly for the four days that we were striking about how ready they are and how prepared they are, about how proud they were of their signs. So it was a long time coming, but I think the, the reinforcement and the conversations that we were having consistently week after week is what really got everyone ready because by that time, everyone was like, all right, strike December 4th. Let's do this. We're ready. Let's do it. Um, let's leave. Let's go. Let's walk out uh, and let's win something for our kids, which we did. So it was awesome. <laughs> yeah. Can, can you talk a bit more about what you won? Yeah. So um, the first and I think one of the biggest things that we were fighting for was um, putting into our contract that Acero schools are sanctuary schools. Um, especially being a seventh grade teacher, knowing and being a social studies teacher, um, my students understand, you know, the immigration status of themselves, of their parents, of their family. Um, and it's a really scary thing, especially in this new political climate that they're living in, um, to not really know what's going to happen to them day after day in school when they're away from home. And not having an article on our contract that solidified that we were sanctuary schools and we were there to protect and like comfort our kids above all else was something that we as teachers just demanded flat out for our families, for our students. And that was something that we got written in. Um, to our contract, which we were just so happy about. We were able to get um, not only salary increases, but actual like salary tables and schedules for our paraprofessionals and our office staff and IT. We were able to um, decrease our class sizes. We were at a cap for 32 and we've effectively decreased our class sizes to 30. And that's something that's gonna happen um, over time. Um, we were able to um, fight for academic freedom for our teachers, um, to have freedom for what they are teaching in their classroom, not just being told, hey, here's a curriculum that we heard from someone else that works, so now you're doing that, which is what a lot of our teachers were hearing um, in like this current school year, and it was making them very unhappy with what they were teaching and how they were teaching it, and it was ineffective for a lot of the kids. Um, we were able to um, fight for a shorter school year and not a shorter instructional day for kids. Our instructional minutes are still the same, but shorter duties for teachers because a lot of what our time is spent in school doing is not necessarily teaching, but like being on lunch duty, being on hallway duty and, and doing all of these things that take away our classroom time from being able to teach and meet with students and plan and prepare for hard days um, and there's countless other things but those were the really big things that we were fighting for um, what we were willing to go on strike for so the fact that we were able to get that for our teachers for our families for our students um, it was a huge victory for us mm -hmm. um, thank you for sharing uh, all that uh, Hillary um, and and thank you to the to the rest of the panelists again that was Hillary Nafziger, um, who a uh, Chicago charter school teacher uh, who just took part in a victorious uh, strike there, the first charter school strike uh, in U.S. history. Um, and there are still some uh, schools where teachers and paraprofessionals are uh, union members and are, and are in negotiations, right? Mm -hmm. so keep yeah, so <laughs> we were ahead of everyone else um, in terms of our bargaining. Um, and we were the first contract to be ratified across um, the city, but there are 11 other contracts still on the table. Um, the nice thing is, is we we're trying to line them all up so that they all expire at the same time with CTU's contract in four years, um, which will give us more bargaining power next time around. But now we're just standing in solidarity with everyone else and sort of leading the way to say like, we fought for this and it was hard and it was a struggle, but we stayed strong and we stuck to our bottom line. And if we can do it, you can do it. So total solidarity all across the city for all of these other charters that are bargaining and hopefully winning very soon. Fantastic. Um, so <clears throat> I think now we'll open it up for some questions. Um, 
but I will uh, I will just ask the questions um, that others are submitting. If you if you have a question that you'd like to suggest, um, we probably won't have time to get to all of them, but uh, you can feel free to throw that in the Q and A or in the chat box. Um, uh, and to our panelists, I just want to thank you all again, Jenny, uh, Mari Cruz, Matt, and Hillary. If any of you have to go, just just let me know. Um, uh, but before I go to the Q and A, just just want to say if uh, if people are interested in finding out more about uh, Labor Notes, uh, you can visit our website, labornotes.org. You can subscribe to our magazine there. It comes out every month. Uh, it's been coming out every month for 40 years as of next February. Um, we're going to be organizing a number of different celebrations around the country and uh, events to to commemorate our. 40th anniversary, and we've also got, I don't know, about a, a dozen troublemaker schools lined up in cities across the country next year. Um, and we'll be, you know, continuing to, to cover uh, exciting things happening in the labor movement and just trying to, uh, to network rank and file uh, union activists. Um, also, if you'd like to support Labor Notes, you can visit labornotes.org slash donate. We're in the midst of our end of the year fund right, fundraising drive right now too. Um, so uh, one question that somebody asked, um, and I'm going to unmute all the panelists right now. So just just be warned, you're all unmuted. Um, so, so one question that someone asked, which, you know, if anybody wants to give a quick answer to is, uh, you know, we were talking about strikes, uh, but what actions or events did you take before striking or to get ready uh, to strike. I know Hillary just talked a bunch about that, um, you know, but was there anything, uh, you know, in particular that, that you would, uh, you know, that, that you did before, before you went on strike that you would, would like to mention? Well, we did in Hawaii, we did several uh, community actions. So, um, you know, I guess major demonstrations, um, uh, two specifically, um, one on uh, Labor Day here, um, same thing, just to bring increased public awareness, um, to demonstrate to uh, our company that we were bargaining with, hey, look, like we have the, the people are ready to walk, the people are standing up um, and standing together. Um, um, it, those community actions are without a doubt a necessary part of kind of the pre-strike activity, um, mostly so that the community is aware of what the situation is with your membership and with your union, um, mostly so they can get behind you and, and you can find that support out there. It's, um, I think it's important to have community involvement. Um, uh, Mary Cruz mentioned churches. Also, we had here in Hawaii, we had um, our local politicians um, aware of, and prior to us striking, they were aware that, that that we were bargaining and looking to potentially go on strike. And then actually, once we went on strike, they were, they came, both the governor, the, uh, Governor David Ige, um, uh, Mayor Kirk Caldwell, uh, many of our state representatives um, came out and actually walked on the lines with us, um, as well as making public statements on their own websites and on and via their own platforms in support of um, Local 5 here. Um, and I think it's very important to have public demonstrations leading up to a strike, you know, to show the, the company that you're acting against, hey, look, here is the power of the people. Uh, we are all here closing down the street, <laughs> causing chaos, and, and this is what you have to deal with. And um, very important to have those types of activities, I think. Yeah, for us, uh, what worked for us was that uh, we did surveys. We also um, set up our priorities and our bottom lines. And we did organize with the, uh, we invited the members actually to come and participate on our bargaining sessions. So we opened the room for them to come and listen to what the university had to tell us about our proposals and hear the arrogance with what the university was behaving yeah. with against us you know and it's like uh telling the workers uh, uh, you know what you don't deserve it we do appreciate that you put us up on the 
public eye as a, a biggest and better public institution in the country, but you know what, you're not worth it. So it pissed them off. And the workers actually um, were on board because they did actually had firsthand contact with those bargaining sessions. And we do uh, rotate, rotation in between um, campuses and medical centers when we were bargaining. So our members had the opportunity to come and hear it in every campus and every uh, medical center. And we do organize actions during uh, bargaining also, so members can participate actively on what we were uh, we were uh, fighting for. And like I said, outsourcing was it's a big thing for us. Uh, there's not the disparity of treatment between workers when you are outsourced, you don't get the same pay, you don't have the protections, you don't have the benefits. And we want the university to end those practices because that only uh, targets our jobs and, and also uh, doesn't improve the, the quality of life of the people that are working for these institutions. So yeah, setting the priorities and having the workers involved in the whole process of bargaining, that helped us to lead up to our strike. I would say that we did the same thing we did. We really encouraged the membership to be involved in the bargaining. There was, I think, 17 official bargaining committee members, but any other members were invited to sign up and come and witness the bargaining sessions. I wish we could have rotated amongst our medical centers the way you guys did. Um, all of ours were held at a central location in downtown Oakland, so people had to travel to come see it. But the other thing that um, our union was really on top of this time around um, was sending out uh, bargaining updates from every day that we went to bargaining to all of our membership mm -hmm. on the Mobilize um, platform. And then also starting a social media campaign. I'll share the link to it in the chat window. Um, it's called Kaiser Don't Deny, and it was intended to be reposted um, onto uh, Facebook, Twitter, and invite patients and clinicians and community members to post what their concerns are. It also was a, had a link that you could see what our bargaining platform was and our big ticket sort of goals for the bargaining um, and what we were aiming to do prior to going out on strike to try to really get the word out in the community. Great. Uh, thank you all for your answers to that. And what, one thing I would just add is that, uh, you know, one of the functions of Labor Notes is to collect stories or, you know, uh, answers to these types of questions that, uh, um, uh, and then share them. And so, you know, I would urge people to check out our books like the Troublemaker's Handbook um, or Secrets of a Successful Organizer um, or How to Jumpstart Your Union about the Chicago Teachers, um, which, you know, uh, and also to share your stories with us. If anybody wants to get in touch uh, with me, you can write me at dan at labornotes.org. That's D-A-N at labornotes.org. And, you know, if uh, anything sparked your mind here, or you have any further questions, uh, please do that. Uh, I just want to go to one more question and we'll see what we have time for after that. Um, but I think it's phenomenal. We have, uh, you know, participants ranging from, uh, I'm on the East Coast, uh, and then we've got Hillary in Chicago uh, and Matt and Mari Cruz uh, from, from California, um, and then Jenny in Hawaii. But this question comes from Stephen in a remote location in Alaska. Uh, and he says, uh, he says he's president of a small 29 member local in a ro remote location in Alaska. He asks, what strategies were you able to use that might be helpful in reducing the fear of retaliation for members for whom there is no anon anonymity in numbers? Um, so I know that's, that's a specific question, but you know, what do you, what do, you do to to, to help reduce the, the fear that people uh, have. Um, what, what we do is that uh, we actually invite workers to make it personal, like uh, what the, the regions of the university do to us, it's, it takes um, a toll in our families, right? At our own homes. So why not bring it to them at their own homes, at their own offices? Where they, where they function, where they have uh, people who admire them. So uh, any event that they do, we bring a group of workers and workers love to do that. Like they see the fear mm -hmm. in their faces, they see the, the nervousness that they react to. And also they know that we're not playing. 
that our families matter, that our, our, our uh, conditions that they're putting us on are not okay, and that we need to get it improved, and that we are serious when we're saying that we need to have protections at the workplace. We also have language in the contract that says that uh, there's not to be retaliation against us. Educating the members about their labor laws also is mm -hmm. a big piece because that way they know that they're not alone, that the laws actually protect them against retaliation. And we yeah. make sure they are very aware of the wine garden rights, which are protections to, against retaliation when you have a union activity going on. And so putting that up front and giving them the confidence of yeah, if you participate and you are very active in your union, you actually protect it. You're not going to be mm -hmm. retaliated against. And if they dare to do it, you're going to have the union behind you. Yep, correct. I'd also say that like mm -hmm. in everyday work environment, being very, very cognizant of like every article of your contract so that anytime there's an infringement, you as the steward seem incredibly knowledgeable and ready to stand up to management so yeah. that they get the sense, the feeling that you have them, you've got their back and you're like looking out for them, really encourages people to participate. Mm -hmm. When they see that I would agree. being effective. Yeah, I would totally agree with, with that. Um, without a doubt, um, informing the members of actually what their legal rights are uh, is huge. It's, it's very important. Um, that instills confidence and then and then definitely Matt exactly what you just said like making sure in the workplace every day um, that you are vocal about what the stipulations of your contract are what we can and can't do what the managers can and can't do um, being open and vocal and upfront about that without a doubt kind of um, assure, reassures the the other members um, you know that they're not alone and that what they're doing is acceptable is right is you know well within their their uh, well within the law <laughs> um, mm -hmm. that's a very important thing for people to know um, to instill confidence to stand up for themselves anybody else want to add anything same <laughs> um, <laughs> especially with like new teachers um, who are, you know, non-provisional, non-tenured, they're afraid, you know, it's my first year and we're on strike and I don't know what to do. Um, but again, like being kind of like that veteran voice of these are your rights, this is what you're entitled to as a union member, this is what we are protecting you from. And then just making sure that they know, like, just be diligent if you notice something shifty happening and something shady is going on and all of a sudden, like, you're getting called out for things that weren't happening before, like keep a collection of everything and make sure you're contacting your representative and your building and, and voicing your concerns um, while still like staying true to the fact that we are in this together as a collective unit. And if they're gonna punish you for something like this, like just know that they can't um, and they can't scare you out of standing up for yourself and your rights. This may sound a little counterintuitive, but I would also say that there's a role for being an effective counterpart to management when things are going well. Like if you are not in the midst of a difficult bargaining and contracts are being fairly enforced, being seen as somebody who works effectively with like immediate management to get things done and resolved to make workers' lives easier on a day-to-day -day basis, mm -hmm. it'll, it'll get, it conveys the idea that you're not just here to be a thorn in management side all the time, but you absolutely yeah, are and like call things out when something not cool is going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, um, important to recognize that we're here to solve problems, not just to point them out. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I, I don't want to keep you all for too long. Um, so maybe we can just, maybe we can just, you know, call it a night. What do you think? Or, or call it an afternoon, Jenny. Um, <laughs> what is it? It's like two o'clock there. Um, uh, five, five. Oh, five, okay. Coming up on my beautiful sunset hour. <laughs> oh, yeah. Can't miss that. Um, but I just want to, again, uh, you know, thank all the panelists. Uh, there was a lot that happened this year, um, you know, and we uh, have had the privilege at Labor Notes of, you know, of, of covering uh, a lot of it, you know, including the, the brilliant 
uh, West Virginia and Arizona and Oklahoma, and, uh, teacher strikes and beyond. Um, <clears throat> you know, and there's a lot of phenomenal organizing that we're seeing uh, in places like Amazon uh, among largely Somali uh, immigrant workforce in, in the Twin Cities, um, or I think the Google walkouts um, have, have been really uh, incredible and are something to keep an eye on. But uh, I would, I'm so uh, glad that we, you know, were able to hear from the, the four of you, uh, you know, and, and really, I think, have a collective conversation. And I certainly learned a lot, and I'm sure that our uh, attendees uh, were, were watching at home uh, learned a lot as well. And, you know, I hope that we can continue this conversation uh, going forward um, and, and, you know, and continue building the, the troublemaking wing of the labor, labor movement. Um, so thank you all for, for joining us. Uh, and thank, thanks to everybody uh, who stayed on the call uh, and, and, and listened to this conversation. Um, and we'll do it again sometime uh, because we are right. to be doing these things every month. So, so we'll see you in 2019. Um, Yay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Take care. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. <laughs>